Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to discuss Panda, an incredible organism that you might know or might not know, but that you definitely should know. Something that we actually covered a couple of years ago, and something that I wanted to talk about again, because there have been some updates, and because we've just discovered something else about it that we never knew before. But I guess first, let's discuss so exactly what is Pando and why is it so important. Well, technically, it's kind of what you see right here, but I guess let's make this a little bit more realistic. So let's jump on Google Earth and try to figure out where exactly it is. Okay, first of all, where is Utah? All right, got it. So if we were to zoom in somewhere in this location, there's going to be a lake called Fish Lake. Uh, not sure where exactly it is, but I think, oh, there it is. All right, so in this location, there is actually a really intriguing place that's called Pando Aspen Tree. Now this might sound like some kind of a town or maybe some kind of a lodge, but it's not. This is literally Pando. This whole area can be described as a single organism. And an organism that contains an enormous amount of mass and has very likely existed on the planet for an extremely long time. Or you can also visualize it this way. And so that's basically Pando. You can actually think of it as a kind of a super tree. And you can actually learn some of the basics about this organism and some of the older discoveries in some of the videos in the description. But around that time when I made those videos, this wonderful person, Lance Audit, actually sent me an email asking me to talk about a nonprofit known as Friends of Pando, an organization that essentially tries to basically protect Pando, study Pando, teach people about Pando, and basically everything Pando Pando Pando. So if you click on one of the links in the description, you can literally just explore everything by yourself and even explore it in 360 by going through individual pictures and by seeing what it looks like to be inside Pando. So yeah, as you can see right here, this is basically your typical forest, an aspen forest. But aspen trees are slightly different from other trees, mostly because of their DNA. This species known as Populus tremuloides, also known as the quaking aspen tree or trembling aspen tree, mostly because of the noise it produces due to the shape of its leaves, is what's known as a triploid, and that's because its cells contain three copies of each chromosome, instead of two like in us. And as a result of this, Pando, or basically any Aspen, cannot reproduce sexually. It cannot mix its DNA through sexual reproduction, and instead has to rely on other means to both reproduce and to mutate. And it reproduces using cloning. It creates a bunch of clones of itself, which then spread from a central point covering a really large area. And so all of the offspring, or basically all of the tree trunks, are technically genetically identical. Or at least, so we think. But turns out that they're not perfectly identical, as was discovered in the recent study we're discussing today. But before we jump into that study, just a few more facts. So Pando is actually Latin, and it simply means I spread. And that's obviously because of the way it grows. It spreads from a central location, and as of 2024, seems to consist of 47,000 individual stems that cover approximately 43 hectares. Or essentially it's about 1 by 1 kilometer in area. But obviously, underneath all of these trees, there is an enormous network containing a huge root system, supporting the entire organism and basically making it whole. And so in reality what you see in here, this is just the surface features. Each of these trees is only going to survive for approximately 100 years, but is then going to be replaced by a clone that's going to continue the cycle. And while aspens are basically everywhere in North America, they grow in a lot of different locations, including Canada, and all represent individual clonal organisms. Now, we actually have no idea how many there are, or if Pando is even the biggest and the most massive, but as of 2024, nothing bigger or more massive has been discovered yet. Naturally making this a fascinating organism and a super cool tree. Now, in the last two years, there's actually been some problems with Pando, specifically in regards to grazers, or things like deer, for example, trying to basically eat it. We've talked about this in one of the videos in the description. But ever since then, it started to recover dramatically, because there's now an enormous fence that prevents animal entry. And so Pando is now technically under government protection. But there are still some really important questions, and some intriguing unanswered questions, that can only be tackled using genetics. For example, how old is this organism? And more specifically, did it actually survive the last ice ages? And if so, how? Now, intriguingly, based on its location, we know that approximately 20,000 years ago, the glaciers here advanced to within approximately 2 kilometers 
away from its current location, and so it was actually always believed that it must have been much younger, or maybe it was much much smaller back then, or even potentially just a tiny seedling. And so in this recent study, Roseanne Pinot and her team decided to investigate Pando using genetical analysis. And here this was done by collecting over 500 different samples from a lot of different locations that we know belongs to Pando, with the main focus being mutations and DNA analysis trying to figure out how old it potentially is. And to answer the age question, here researchers definitively established that it's over 16,000 years old. But it could also be up to 80,000 years old, and that's actually where things get a little bit more mysterious. Here by discovering additional aspen pollens in the nearby deposits, they actually discovered that these trees were here for at least 60,000 years, despite there being glaciers. But here, because this was a genetic analysis, they were also able to establish the spread of mutations. Now, unlike sexual trees or sexual organisms, here, since there is no genetic mixing, and since all of these are clones, we don't really expect the genes to be too different. Yet here it was established that mutations definitely happened, and various stems that were slightly farther away contained slightly different genes compared to one another. And so the genes here definitely accumulated various mutations, despite this technically still being a clone. But intriguingly, these mutations were not spreading in the way you'd expect them to spread. So here there were actually over 4,000 different genetic variants, but surprisingly there was no correlation between the number of mutations and the spatial location. So basically here you would expect closer trees to be maybe a little bit more related to each other compared to trees farther away. But this is not at all what was discovered. Instead the distance was only a minor correlation, and these intraorganism mutations actually seem to be kind of random. Now it's actually not clear exactly why this is so, and why there were certain trees that were more mutated than other trees, but right now one explanation here is that maybe this is actually in regards to how repair works. There might be some kind of a mechanism preventing accumulation and spread of mutations, which is effective enough to make these trees almost clone-like, but not perfect clones. And so this would explain why these mutations seem to be distributed kind of randomly. And so even though these are clones, they're obviously not perfect clones. Which of course reveals one potential way this organism can still evolve, especially when faced with difficult conditions. And that's actually the biggest question here. How exactly did this tree survive for thousands and thousands of years? And we know that it survived quite a lot. So it did survive the ice ages, but it also survived multiple fires, and lots of different environmental changes that happened in the last 60,000 years. Now unfortunately right now there are really no answers to anything yet, but we might actually get more answers from studies like this and from similar genetic analysis in the future. But the most important discovery from this study was really the discovery of these intraorganism mutation rates that seem to occur inside clonal organisms. And the initial discovery basically suggests that mutations do happen quite a lot, but there's some kind of a mechanism preventing accumulation that's essentially trying to maintain genetic consistency and prevent these clones from being too different. With the size of Pando dramatically increasing in the last 25,000 years, and possibly because of these environmental changes caused by the last glaciation event. And in the last 15,000 years, it extremely likely maintained its size, possibly only growing just a little bit, but also competing for space with a lot of other aspen trees in the area. And it looks like it will probably survive for many many more years to come and it's probably going to outlive all of us, and possibly even the modern civilization. But if you'd like to learn more about Pando, check out Friends of Pando website in the description, or another link from the website called Ecosystem Sound that actually has a collection of really unique sounds recorded by an artist Jeff Rice, who basically created a bunch of tracks based on a lot of different sounds made by Pando. Now these are copyrighted, so I'm not going to play them here, mostly because I don't know how YouTube is going to react to this, but the link for this is in the description. Anyway, we'll definitely come back and talk more about Pando once there are some additional studies or additional discoveries, but as of today, this is still a record holder for the largest, most massive, and now the oldest organism on the entire planet, and an organism hiding lots of different mysteries even today. But if you'd like to find out about other super organisms, check out some other videos in the description, and subscribe because we're going to discuss this more in some of the future videos. Thank you for watching, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.